Good morning guys, good morning internet, this is CJ back once again with another narrated art time lapse video for you guys and today we'll be talking about this piece, Dad's Home, that I did or posted early in 2019 and it's a piece that I created sometime in 2018 so yeah it's been a while since i've done this so this would be very very interesting to look back at it and see what i have done <laughs> but yeah to start out with i have a 3d mock-up that i made in blender that unfortunately i was not in the habit of recording yet when i made this piece uh, nowadays i'm recording the blender 3d part uh, that I do if I use a 3d mockup for my illustration But for this particular piece. I I did not get the chance to record what I did in blender but um, you could see a Blurred out image of it right now on the left um, Basically what I did in blender was uh, I just put a bunch of boxes uh, Just to kind of stand in for the shapes that I want in in the illustration um, I created a few trees and the trees were really simple. It was just like a uh, regular cylinder with a bunch of circles for leaves and whatnot. And I don't think I use the my character creator MB Lab to create the characters. I think I just have it. I take it back. I do have characters uh, that I created from the manual Bastioni Lab character creator plugin for Blender. I use some of them in the Blender part. Um, and yeah, uh, I used those uh, as standing for the characters. And then of course I lit the scene. Uh, I did some funky thing with the shadows. Um, but yeah, uh, unfortunately I, you guys did not get to see the uh, image. Uh, except for like again, the blurred out version of it. But I took that image and basically I just sketched over it. Uh, which is what you just saw me do the past two minutes. You You saw me or you watched me sketch the scene out and now uh i'm laying down a bunch of colors to just kind of set the scene in essentially that was what the quick color mode was you know i put in pink for highlights and then greens for you know the rest of the scene pretty much because it pretty much was going to be like a green scene and then now I'm photo bashing <laughs> tons and tons of photos that I use from textures.com um, and eventually later on you will uh, see me use a bunch of photos from uh, Google Maps but for now the most predominant photos that I'm photo bashing into the scene are photos that I use from that I got from textures.com And so now that the photo bash part is done, um, I went back and added some highlights and some color dodge layers as well as multiply layers to kind of work in the values um, and have the values all balanced out uh, with the painting. 
Then as soon as I have that, I merged everything into one layer to pretty much blend everything in. This has been pretty much my standard practice that, you know, after I do my initial photo bashing, um, my initial sketch and my initial colors, I pretty much kind of just smudge everything into like uh, this base painting, which is what I call it. Um, so yeah, this is pretty much what I'm doing right now. I'm just kind of just smudging everything into general shapes of what I want things to be. Um, so yeah, it's kind of akin to working with pastels in a way. Um, when I work with pastels, I pretty much, you know, smudge everything in just to have that little bit of color blending in um, as background. And then obviously I layer pastels on top of the blending smudge. So it's kind of like the same thing here, you know, where I smudge everything, kind of ruin essentially what I was working on in a way. And then kind of go back and repaint stuff over that. So yeah. Now at this part, I'm trying to add the atmospheric perspective in. Um, so basically, I just took like a blue color and I kind of just slowly worked it in in multiple different layers. Um, the layers all have like different opacity settings to it. Uh, you can see that the farther away the the area is like in the top middle part of the painting, uh, since that area is very far, far from the viewer, uh, it would have most of the faded out look of the atmospheric perspective. And so, yeah. And now I'm adding a few more photo bashing. Now I want to do like a compare contrast uh, with this particular video and compare it and contrast it with the last video that I have, the last narrated polished illustration video that I have. Not necessarily the last one I posted, but the last polished illustration I did that has narration. And that um, video was the Valley of the Rules. Um, that was the last polished narrated illustration that I did. Now, the reason why I want to compare this one to the Valley of the Rules is because they're both forest scenes. Uh, they're both set in a forest. Um, and they be, pretty much have like the same feel to it, which is a wooded area. Uh, it's a landscape with characters in it, essentially. And um, I was going to just talk real quick about like the time factor, because if you look at the amount of time that I uh, worked on in the Valley of the Rules, you'll see that I, I worked on it for about 55 hours. Well, with this piece, I only worked 17 hours on it. And I wanted to highlight, you know, the reasons why, essentially. Um, the number one factor as for why this piece went by faster than the Valley of the Rules even though they're both polished illustrations, uh, which means they both have tons of details in it. Um, the reason why this went faster is because the focal area, which is the the hut, the Nipah hut, and the running girl, that's pretty much the focal point of this uh, piece. And since the focal point is small compared to the Valley of the Rules, where the focal point was in the foreground area, there was a lot less for me to detail, essentially. So detailing this piece went by so much quicker than that, than Valley of the Rules. Valley of the Rules, I worked agonizingly on it for 55 hours. And, you know, compared to this one where it was 17 hours, you know, just this one just went by so quick and I was so happy with it. Um, but yeah, um... So that's really the number one reason why this went by faster. Um, the other thing that I really wanted to mention, though, was that, um, and I guess the most important thing for me to relate to, you know, my clients, my future clients, is that there's really no way to predict how long an illustration would take. Um, Dad's home and Valley of the Rules are both forest areas, forest scenes. And you would think that, you know, if I get enough practice with forest scenes, you know, all the times 
or the amount of time it would take me to draw a forest scene would be like significantly less. But that's not really the case. I mean, take this for example. I did Dad's Home before I did Valley of the Rules. Now, let me take it back. I think I was working on Valley of the Rules, but then I finished Dad's Home way quicker than I finished Valley of the Rules, essentially. But the reason why I wanted to mention this again is uh, to reiterate my point is that there's really no way to predict how long it would take to do a finished painting or a polished illustration. Um, it really depends on the factors of the painting and, you know, certain parts of the painting, you know, I mean, because like I said, I mean, even though Dad's home is pretty much just the same as Valley of the Rules, where they're both set in the forest scene, um, there's factors in each painting that would dictate how long it would take. Um, in this case, the focal point is smaller than the focal point in Valley of the Rules. And so, of course, this one is going to go quicker. But even then, I mean... You know, I couldn't really sit there and say that the size of the focal point is going to be what dictates how long a piece would be. You know, because even if they both have the same focal point, it's the amount of details that is needed for the focal point, for example. I mean, if you have, say, just a simple person wearing simple clothes that doesn't have that much texture, that one's going to go by much quicker to detail compared to a person who has intricate details uh like think of um like a navajo indian garb or something uh very intricate detail or a 15th century you know monarch dress for example with patterns and flourishes in the costume i mean detailing that would be so much more would take so much longer than detailing is a simple white t-shirt so but yeah i just wanted to highlight that essentially just to kind of connote the idea that there's really no predicting how long an illustration would take um it could take 30 minutes or it could take you know 300 hours it just really depends on the piece so yeah Another thing that I wanted to mention about this particular um, illustration is that I took a totally different approach with this one than with the Valley of the Rules. In Valley of the Rules, I did most of my photo bashing around the middle part of uh, the process where I photo bashed some stuff in and then I blended everything and then I photo bashed some more. But after pretty much, you know, the photo bash part, um in the middle area er everything that was done afterwards was just pretty much just detailing on this one i kind of took a different approach um where i have my base paint which is pretty much this right now and what i keep doing is i, I would take the photos back and re-photo bash them in so basically i was working on the photo textures 
uh, detail by detail. Um, you just saw me just work on the Nipa hut, for example, where I took all the photos that I used initially and just kind of just brought them back and then kind of layered them in with low opacity setting and then kind of drew them in. And then you'll start seeing me do that throughout the image where instead of just having like one huge chunk session of photo bashing, you know, I did it pretty much throughout the whole entire process, the whole making of this. Um, so yeah, I guess it's another interesting thing to know um, on this one, because you would think that uh, having them all in one go, like I did in Valley of the Rules, would make things go faster, but that's not really the case. Because um, I mean, in this one, you know, I photo bash initially, blended it in, and then just pretty much kept photo bashing just all throughout the process of this one. But yeah, different illustrations needs different approaches. I know for a fact that when I, when I was working on this piece, I was still kind of like a noob in a way, you know? Um, I haven't really done a whole lot of uh, environments at this point. And so, I mean, I've done a few. Um, but definitely not forested scenes like this one. So yeah. So yeah, I'm constantly evolving basically with my style. This area I'm working on, I really love. This is probably like one of my favorite areas in the illustration was this leaves that I'm about to draw in. And the uh, coconut slash banana tree behind the Nipah hut or the forest area behind the Nipah hut. Um, I love that area too. Uh, I just thought it was just like a cool little detail that I added. The little plantain tree behind the Nipah hut right now you can see it in the lower right. Um, yeah, <laughs> I thought that was a cool detail. Here I am using some of uh, Krita's built-in brushes, kind of just layering them in, well trying to anyways. Then I realized that I really wasn't getting the look that I wanted so I kind of just ended up painting the actual leaves themselves instead of using the brushes. But yeah, I, I think this area that I just worked on was, was done very well. And here I am about to work on the area behind the Nipah hut, which again, like I said, is my favorite part. I don't know what it is about those two areas. I just, I just love how I did these two areas. I thought they were done very, very well. So I'm basically smudging some of the details that I got from the photos. Now a lot of photo bashers, they never ever do this. You know, as soon as they lay in their photos, they never destroy the details that the photos create. Um, and this is pretty much standard for most matte painters. I, on the other hand, I really am not too sold on the whole photorealistic look that photo bashing tries to achieve. It's kind of too uncanny too much in the middle of the uncanny valley for me you know uh, i guess i like my painterly look in a way so you know i guess depending on the clients if they really like the whole photorealistic uh approach that photo bashing does 
and that's what they're you know they dig more than I, I won't do the smudging as much but if the client doesn't care for what kind of look that you know um for any kind of particular look on environment in cases like those i would definitely smudge only because like i like the painterly look like i mentioned you know um it's kind of like a fine balance essentially is what i'm trying to do you know i obviously want to keep some of the details that i got from the photos i mean that's the reason why i use photos in the first place for textures so i definitely want to keep some of the details but i don't want to destroy the details too much by smudging too much um so yeah it's always a fine balance for me you know just trying to get that good look that painterly look um and just trying to avoid the whole uncanny and uh uncanny valley effect so yeah um for the ones who's not very familiar with the term uncanny valley un uncanny valley refers to this phenomenon that happens when people look at particular paintings um the idea basically is that if a painting a realistic painting or a realistic uh, 3d object or any kind of digital uh, imagery the photorealism really needs to be fine-tuned very well or else it kind of runs into the whole weird looking thing you know where it doesn't look uh, painterly and it doesn't look realistic either <laughs> it's basically what ends up happening with the image you know so it ends up being weird looking essentially so what typically what artists typically do is either to spend more time to keep pushing the realism so that it would get past the uncanny valley or what some other artists do is they dial things down so they could get the more cartoony slash painterly look um which is what happened in uh in shrek um when they were designing fiona uh the fiona character the fiona character the initial design of it was apparently too realistic that it looked too weird in the movie because it wasn't cartoony anymore it didn't have the cartoony feel to it you know and so basically what they did with the Fiona character was that they had to redo the character and dial down the realism. And this is basically what I do in my paintings. Even though the whole photo bash, you know, keep the photo details in is very popular with a lot of concept artists. I, on the other hand, I typically don't do this, you know. I typically do the photo bashing in and then dial my photo bashing down. You know to a much more painterly effect now whether i'm successful or not it is totally up to you to decide if i am but you know i try to strike this nice balance between realism photorealism and uh and painterly look so yeah in this piece i was very much still oriented into like the whole realism phase and the same thing with the valley of rules i was still kind of trying to push the realism phase I didn't really start dialing things down until I started working on uh, the Star Wars fan art that I just did. That one didn't have as much photo bash. And the last character illustration that I did, the last polished character illustration I did, um, I'm okay to go. That one didn't have as much photo bashing in it too, which is very surprising compared to some of my earlier works like... Uh, like Queen of the Discarded Robots, for example. And that has a lot of photo bashing in. But yeah, that's what I do in my illustrations. I photo bash, and instead of just painting over the photos and keeping some of the textures of photos, I smudge it. You know, I blend some parts of the photo just to kind of get some form of painterly look. It's been the style that I've been developing that I kind of like and I kind of dig. And unless the person is... Or unless my client is very particular about the look um most of them don't even notice <laughs> most of them you know just likes it so yeah
to looking at his image right now, for the most part, I can tell that it's pretty much almost complete, you know, aside from the characters. But yeah, I did a lot more work. And right now, probably, um, this is the best part of the painting for me. Um, after I did that color correction, I started to really fall in love with this piece. Initially, when I was working on it um, in the past um, 20 minutes that we've been watching, um, the whole time I've been working, you know, um, I was like, yeah, this piece is okay, you know. But when I did that color correction, when I switched things around, I was just like, wow, this piece just became phenomenal in my eyes. I really like how I did the contrast between the dark areas and the light areas, how I pump up the reds on the light areas and pump up the blues on the dark areas. You know, so not only was there a contrast between the light and the dark, there's this contrast between warm color and cool color. And so, yeah, um, those two contrasts in the image, I think is kind of what, pretty much put everything together in a way for me you know when you know after that one part i was like okay i think this this piece is going to turn out okay after all you know instead of before where i was just like yeah this piece is all right it looks like it's gonna go to hell and then after that part i'm like okay i think you might have a standing chance you know i think you might just end up in purgatory you know so yeah that's what I started feeling like with my piece. But yeah, I love that color correction that I did. I, I thought it really brought everything out. Now, it did cause the dark areas to be a little bit darker. Um, which I had a lot of issues with towards the end. And I'm not even sure if I captured all of that towards the end. But I know that once I started sharing this illustration to a bunch of groups that I'm part with, one of the biggest things that they mentioned, one of the biggest things they criticized is the darkness. The darkness of the piece. Um, the foreground was just too dark. And so I had to do a lot of color corrections and color balancing and a lot of value checks um, and curve adjustments just to make sure that it reads okay in all the screens because um, that's the thing with monitors and phones and anything that has a screen um, basically the short version of it is that monitors and screens and phones and tablets they all display colors differently and I think I might have mentioned this in another video. They mention uh, colors differently and they mention, or they mention, <laughs> they display colors differently and they display brightness levels differently. And so I really have to take that into account. Even though this piece looks so amazing in my monitor, it looked horrible on my iPhone. Like it just was not looking good at all in my iPhone. Um, so yeah, I basically had to do like a lot of tweaks towards the end with the whole foreground area because it got too dark. The foreground just got too dark. But yeah, that was like one after effect of what I did with the whole color adjustment. And in hindsight, really, I think the biggest problem I had with the foreground wasn't so much as so much the darkness but i think it really was the saturation value now that i think about it if i had desaturated the foreground area some more i don't think it would have appeared as dark as it does now but yeah a, a lot of people commented on it and so i did corrections on it and i think now would be a good time to talk about um, the hudson river school um for the ones that isn't very familiar with art history the hudson river school was this art movement that happened around the 1800s um and basically they're predominantly a bunch of artists who painted the hudson river area uh, basically the catskill mountains up in the northeast area of the of the u.s um that's where they predominantly did most of their landscape paintings. 
Uh, so yeah, the Hudson River area, basically. And so they were known as the Hudson River School. And uh, they are some of my favorite landscape artists, um, I would have to say. I I'm not familiar with the genre itself. I'm not familiar with a lot of the artists itself. I know that, you know, after a quick glance in Wikipedia, I know that I've seen Albert um, Bierstadt work before. Uh, he's one of the more popular ones, and I hope I pronounced that right. Albert Bierstadt, um, I think is his name. Or it, that is his name. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it. But yeah, like I said, I mentioned, uh, I'm familiar with the movement. I'm familiar with the genre but i couldn't really pinpoint like artists and their works with it you know because it wasn't something that i studied um a whole lot but i know the look um if i see a painting i, I can tell if it has the hudson river quality to it you know um so yeah but anyways a hudson river school i could pretty much say has become one of my influences when it comes to like scenes like this um it's just almost kind of romantic uh it's very heavily influenced by the romanticism actually if if you look it up on wikipedia and if i'm not wrong about my memory and if my memory serves me right the hudson river school movement is very heavily influenced by by the romanticist movement and this particular piece kind of have romantic romantic connotations to it you know i mean when a person takes a look at it it has that you know old country home feel like country road take me home by john denver kind of feel to it you know it's just one of those paintings this a feel good painting um in my opinion anyways i mean some people might look at that and look at this and, and gag and throw up and say oh no this this painting sucks you know i mean everyone's entitled to their own reactions but for the most part i do believe that this this piece kind of has the romantic connotations to it uh this whole romanticized uh vision of what the country or the rural area feels like um so yeah but yeah i painted this too kind of as an ode for for my home country for from where i came from philippines um my the old place that i lived in was very much right next to the woods um i mean i lived in a developed area but it was like a 10 15 minute walk into the the woods basically and in the woods in the forest area there's like a river that we used to go swimming to in the summertime and it kind of has this feel like this particular painting kind of has that feel where it's like you know it's like a totally different world you know you're where i grew up in is very urbanized in a way you know your typical suburban neighborhood you know and not too far from that is just this very quiet very nature-like feel so yeah um it was very nice growing up in that place, let's just say. But yeah, this painting is an ode to my childhood. So, yeah. But yeah, going back to the Hudson River School, I wanted to mention that because this is what this painting reminds me of. And it's a very amazing art movement. So if you're not familiar with it, go check it out. Uh, Albert Bierstadt, especially. Uh, Especially the painting Among the Sierra Nevada Mountains. If you look at that particular painting, you will see that Albert Bierstadt has a heavy influence in a lot of concept art landscapes that you see nowadays, you know? Um, so yeah, definitely check out that movement if you're into environment painting. So right now I'm working in 
where I'm working on the characters, um, the main focal point characters. And uh, initially, I was just going to pin it in, um, or I tried going with uh, with my own artwork, essentially, with my own painted version. But I wasn't happy with it. I, I wasn't happy with the look. I, I wasn't getting the results that I wanted. And so what I ended up doing was I ended up firing up Manuel Bestioni Lab again, the software plugin in Blender that does character creations. And I created characters out of that software so I could photo bash it into this piece. Um, but eventually I kind of ended up doing a mixture of both instead of going with the Manuel Bestioni Lab, as you can see later on the mom character though i i didn't need to worry so much about the mom character because the mom character is so far from the viewer that you know i could pretty much get away with any kind of detail that i put on her it, i could just keep her painterly like I, I think i pretty much just kept her painterly for the most part i don't think i used the mb lab on her at all but yeah she's so far from the viewer that i was i could have I pretty much just got away with just barely detailing her, kind of like the way I did with the dad. But with the little girl that's running towards the dad, I definitely have issues with her. Um, as you can see in a few minutes, I was fussing over her so much. Um, I didn't know, I, did, I just didn't like the look. So I just kept working and reworking her until I finally got what I wanted. So yeah, you can see I'm still trying to work it with this one. And then after drawing the face, I think I pretty much was just like, nope, this isn't going to work. <laughs> and I took out that side part of the Nipa hut too, because I knew that that was distracting from the girl. So I eventually ended up taking that part out. When I was watching this, I, I didn't realize the amount of time I worked on this girl. I worked a lot on this girl. Yeah. Okay, so for now I'm finished with the girl and I start working on something else. Uh, I start working in the den. In hindsight, I think I should have used the... Uh, either a reference or the manual lab too uh, for the dad i mean the overall body is okay but the face I i'm not too happy with especially the ear area i think the ear area where his ears are kind of looks weird and funky and in hindsight i should have fixed it by using reference but i, I never got around to doing it of background rocks which I totally forgot that I did but it really added a sense of realism to the foreground area too
so I guess I didn't like what I did <laughs> after all, because I ended up smudging out all those details. So now I'm working on the girl, or actually I'm working on taking out that Nipah hut. Yeah, there it is. I took it out just so that the girl would stand out more. I remember thinking that that Nipah hut was kind of like obstructing her, kind of hiding her. So taking it all out kind of helped push the car character forward even more. And here's the render that I got from the MB Lab. Man, that smile looks so funky. Wow. I don't know what happened to the software. I don't know if I did some wrong settings or not, but the morph on that face looks really horrible. But I knew that I was going to end up smudging it anyway, so I ended up still using the piece. So yeah. But you see me kind of... Uh, push this character or uh, make this character as tall as the girl and so yeah this is me smudging details in or smudging the rendered part in just so that it's not too photorealistic so I can get like a painterly vibe and so I'm just using the blender texture brush on this just to kind of smudge a few details in or smudge some of the details out and eventually what ended up happening was that even though I was trying to paint or I was trying to use the MB Lab character as my main character what ended up happening was that I, I didn't like the MB Lab pose that I rendered. Because from afar, it looked like the girl just has one leg. Um, it looked really weird and funky. And I liked the pose of my um, first drawing much better than the pose that I have now. So what I ended up doing was I just ended up taking the face of the render and combining it with the post that I have that I painted in. And that's pretty much what happened. See, so yeah, I looking at it now, just this post just looks so unnatural. This does not look right. See, from afar, it just looks like she just has one leg. It just, it looks really odd. And I try to work with it, you know. Try to make some changes. Trying to make it look more natural. But, again, like I said in the end, I just ended up going with the previous version. Yep, here I am, uh, about to redo the whole thing again and go back with the first post.
I keep turning on the earlier layer back on and off just to compare the two. So I kept seeing it flash in and out was because I was trying to compare the two. And again, like I said, in the end, I just I just went with with the older body. Put back to face. I used that arm and then I use the newer arm and then painted everything together and then after this I pretty much I think I worked some more on the foreground kind of adding a little bit more details in I think I went back on the trees to add more details in um, but really, the centerpiece of this illustration is this girl right here. I mean, she's pretty much the focal point, you know. And you can see that I worked a lot on her, you know, just trying to get a good look. Since I know that that's where the viewer's eyes is going to go at first, is her, is that particular girl. So I needed to get her right in a way. But yeah, after her, everything just pretty much just started all falling into peace. Or all falling together or falling into each other or what's the expression all coming together yeah it's all coming together at this point it starts to look really nice here's some more last-minute photo bashing just to get a little bit more details in. Perfect. So yeah, after this last photo bash in, um, like I mentioned earlier, the after I did this photo bashing in, I shared this with a few people, 
and the feedback I got was the whole darkness issue which uh, I started tweaking after this photo bash part in unfortunately I did not get to record that part um, but pretty much what I just did was I just took the shadowed areas and just kind of just lightened it up um, by doing curves adjustment just to make it look more balanced essentially and not as dark but yeah, this piece is pretty much done. Um, yep, it's finished. Thank you guys for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Good night.